Go then and do this. Take away distinctions and similarities of distinctions so that you can love your neighbor. Take away the distinctions of preferences so that you can love your neighbor. But you are not to cease loving the beloved because of this. Far from it. If this were so, the word neighbor would be the greatest fraud ever discovered if you, in order to love your neighbor, must begin by ceasing to love those for whom you have a preference. Moreover, it would also be a contradiction for, if one's neighbor is all men, then no one can be excluded. Shall we now say, least of all the beloved? No, for this is the language of preference. Consequently, it is only the partiality which should be taken away. And yet it is not to be introduced again into the relationship which one's neighbor so that with extravagant preference you love your neighbor in contrast to your beloved. No, as they say to the solitary person, take care that you are not led into the snare of self-love. So it is necessary to say to the two lovers, take care that you are not led by erotic love itself into the snare of self-love. For the more decisively and exclusively preference centers upon one single person, the farther it is from loving the neighbor. You, husband, do not lead your wife into the temptation of forgetting your neighbor because of love for you. You, wife, do not lead your husband into this temptation. The lovers think that in erotic love they have the highest good, but it is not so, for therein they still do not have the eternal secured by the eternal. To be sure, the poet promises the lovers immortality if they are true lovers. But who is the poet? How good is his signature? He who cannot vouch for himself. The royal law, on the other hand, the love command, promises life, eternal life, and this command simply says, you shall love your neighbor. Just as this command will teach every man how he ought to love himself, likewise will it also teach erotic love and friendship what genuine love is. In love towards yourself, preserve love to your neighbor. In erotic love and friendship, preserve love to your neighbor. It may perhaps offend you, well, you know it anyway, that Christianity is always accompanied by signs of offense. Nevertheless, believe it. Do not believe that the teacher who never extinguished a single smoking candle would extinguish any noble fire within a man. Believe that he who was love will teach love to every man. Believe that if all the songwriters united in one song to the praise of erotic love and friendship, what they would have to say would be nothing in comparison with the command, you shall love, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do not stop believing because the command almost offends you, because the discourse does not sound as flattering as that of the poet who courts your favor with his songs, because it repels and terrifies, as if it would frighten you out of the beloved haunts of preference. Do not, for that reason, cease to believe in it. Consider that just because the command and the discourse are what they are, for that very reason the object can be the object of faith. Do not give yourself over to the notion that you might compromise, that by loving some men, relatives and friends, you would love your neighbor, for this would mean giving up the poet without grasping what is Christian. And it was to prevent this compromise that the discourse set between the poet's pride, which scorns all compromise, and the divine majesty of the royal command, which regards any compromise as blameworthy. No, love your beloved faithfully and tenderly, but let love to your neighbor be the sanctifier in your covenant of union with God. Love your friend honestly and devotedly, but let love to your neighbor be what you learn from each other in the intimacy of friendship with God. Death erases all distinctions, but preference is always related to distinctions, yet the way to life and to the eternal goes through death and through the extinction of distinctions. Therefore, only love to one's neighbor truly leads to life. As Christianity's glad proclamation is contained in the doctrine about man's kinship with God, so its task is man's likeness to God. But God is love, therefore we can resemble God only in loving, just as, according to the Apostles' words, we can only be God's co-workers in love. Insofar as you love your beloved, you are not like unto God. For in God there is no partiality, something you have reflected on many times to your humiliation, and also at times to your rehabilitation. Insofar as you love your friend, you are not like unto God, because before God there is no distinction. But when you love your neighbor, then you are like unto God.